The book of Acts chapter 1, those who were here Wednesday night, we know this is the scripture that I read. Uh, just part of our scripture reading it was not intentional, but uh, it'll, it'll sort of make sense once I get into the message. We preached this morning on the thought, an impossible task, impossible task. Acts chapter 1, verse 1, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Now, just to explain that last bit it doesn't have anything to do with the message sometimes people read that they don't understand when it says which is from jerusalem a sabbath day's journey a sabbath day's journey is not very far okay so they were restricted to how far they could even travel on the sabbath day it was a day of rest so when it says it was just a sabbath day's travel it doesn't mean like a whole it wasn't like a 24-hour journey right they're not very far away and so he's telling them to go back and of course last week we celebrated easter and the resurrection. And I, I think for many years as a pastor, it just seems like there's such a buildup to Easter from, from being a pastor. Our, our minds, our spirits go to that Easter and resurrection. Now, I, I have seen, I, I've not, not kept track of this, but it seems like a lot of the times after Easter, my mind goes to these early scriptures. Because it's sort of like, well, okay, what, did that, what happened with that? What happened after so we know it's so monumental, and we talk about all that, it, how it affected the entire world, but, but what did they do with it, and how did it get started to lead to where we are now? And it really starts in this scripture. Jesus is there, and he is now ascending back to the Father. He is leaving his earthly ministry. No more will they be able to see and touch him uh, as they had before and even eventually after the resurrection and so they're, they're sort of, uh, you know, they, I think they feel like, well, what are we going to do? There's been this great miracle. He's been resurrected, but now he's leaving us. And he had been trying to teach them and trying to instruct them, but he's very, very clear that, that the Holy Spirit is coming and is going to help them. And so the resurrection has happened. Forty days has passed. He's ascended, or he's ascending. This is the beginning of the church, and and verse 8 says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, so where they were at. I know a lot of you know this, but not everyone does, so I want to explain it. Jerusalem is where they were at. And then in all of Judea. And then in Samaria. So it's, it's painting a picture of this is where they are, but the gospel is to go further and further and further until he says unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, we are the uttermost parts of the earth. A part of, the, at least our civilization didn't even exist as part of the earth at that time, meaning 
This is, this is way before 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. For those that don't know your history. Of course, there, it wasn't inhabited, but what I'm just saying, there was no United States of America, so we weren't even thought about yet. But Jesus knew. Do you understand that? He knew where we would be, and he knew what the uttermost parts of the earth really meant. They really didn't understand what that meant. But it would mean that it would start and it would spread throughout all of the earth. And that's why the message this morning is an impossible task. That's impossible. That cannot happen. What Jesus is asking them to do, it cannot be done. It's impossible. There were no phones. There was no internet. There were no satellites, no TVs, no cars. Why would they even want to live? There were no fast food restaurants. There were no Texas Roadhouse Rolls. Life was barely worth living. There was no way. Right now, we think in terms of, of marketing. Now, I'm not, a very, I'm not a marketing person, but in my job, I've worked with a lot of companies. And one of the, one of the things, depending on the kind of business you're in, is the kind of marketing that you're going to do. And I've seen businesses make mistakes and that they'll, they'll start off their business, and especially if it's something local, something where they want local people to buy. Now, again, this is going back, I don't know, uh, several years ago. It's, it doesn't happen as much now, but people would say, well, first thing I need to do is get a website. Eh, wrong. Let's just do have some marketing class 101. You don't need a website. You might eventually need a website, but if your business is local and you're trying to get local people to buy, you don't need a website. You know what you need? A Facebook page. That's what you need. Because people aren't going to go to your website if they don't know it exists. And so you want to go to social media where people live. That's where people really live. And so you're marketing and you're saying, but if it's something where you're trying to get a, a a market in the marketplace that's all across the country or worldwide, then yes, you want to have some kind of website and then drive people to that website. They had none of this. They didn't have a Life, life Change Church Pike County Facebook page. All they had was their mouths and their feet. Their only tools of marketing the new gospel was to tell people and then walk to the next town and tell those people. It was impossible that they were going to go to, from Jerusalem to all Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth when all they had was the power of their mouth and the power of their feet. What he was asking them to do could not be done. They could do it with word of mouth. They could do it in person. They could do it with gatherings. They could do it with just how many miles could they cover in a day. And yet, they got it done. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Folks, the church world today, we have an impossible task. I know that at times... When you see so many church buildings in the Bible Belt, every corner and every ridge and every holler uh, and every street has a church and a lot of them are, are less than half full and people just think, well, you know, it's just the, everybody's heard and, and nobody's going to respond. It is the absolute opposite of that. If everyone heard the message and responded to the message and God saved Jacob, we wouldn't have enough churches to hold all the people that are out there. It is not from a lack of opportunity. It is from a lack of the church spreading the gospel and impacting people's lives for the kingdom. It is not because that there's not enough people out there or, well, we just ran through everybody. We've already witnessed to everybody. No, that we, there is an endless supply of those that need to hear the gospel. But at times it seems impossible. The work of the church is overwhelming. If we think just about our community, how many people in our community need to hear the gospel? How many people just in your families? If we just pick three or four families here 
And we said, imagine that everybody in your immediate family and then your extended family, your siblings' families, your cousins, all your first cousins, all your second cousins, all your aunts and uncles and so on, if they all got saved, if between two or three of you, I know some of your families, we'd be full. <laughs> that's it. We wouldn't have any more room. And that's just from two or three families. So don't ever act like, well, we're done. It seems impossible if you begin to think how overwhelming it is of how much work there really is to do. Matthew chapter 9 verse 37 says, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. It is not because the fields are not white unto harvest. It's not because it's not out there to be harvested in. It is because there's not enough people, there's not enough of God's people that are out there trying to bring in the harvest into the church. The laborers are few. Do you know what the biggest thing that's affecting the economy right now is? A shortage of workers. Now, I don't, want to get into, I don't want to get into debates on why that is. Some people will blame this. Some people will blame that. I just blame there's a whole lot of people who just don't want to work. Amen. Am I being political or is that just good common sense? <laughs> if you want to work right now, there are jobs all over. It may not be what you want to do. It may not be how much you want to make. It may, it may be more labor intensive than what you want it to be, but I'm telling you, I work in this every single day in all over Southeast Ohio and every company that I deal with, every one of them says the same thing. I can't find enough people that want to work. The advice, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I've told Haley too, but I, I know I'm going to use no because I can remember the actual conversation. When he got his first job, part-time job last year, and he really turned Richie's marketplace around. I mean, he went in there. <laughs> he was a cashier. Probably, my mom thinks he's the best cashier they ever had. And uh, you know what I told him? And I think they were really happy with him as a worker. But, but I told Bethany, I said, he might be the worst cashier in the history of the world. I have no idea. I did go in there once and see him working. He seemed to do fine. But you know why they liked him? Because he never missed a day of work and he was never late. And some of you that are employers, what's the biggest thing you're all you're asking? You, even if you're not good at your job, can you just come every day? And can you just be on time? Listen, if you can be on time and if you can show up, most places are going to be thrilled to death to hire you. I'm not even looking, Chad. <laughs> Say, Mick, what's the have to do with anything? Listen, in the work of the Lord, a lot of you are think, I can't do that. I'm not talented enough. I'm telling you, and as a pastor, all we're asking is that you show up and you show up on time and you be willing and God will, there'll be something you can do to affect the kingdom. There's something you can do to work for the Lord. There's something you can do to help bring in the harvest. God's not asking about your talent. He's not worried about your ability. He's not worried about how dynamic you are. Will you get up and will you show up for work? And will you stand in your place? Will you do what God has called you to do? Amen. That's all he's asking. Yes. The angel said, stop gazing toward heaven and go do something in your lives. I want you to right now, just quickly, I may or not get to my points. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach two hours. But just real quickly, I mean, I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you a second to let this sink in. I want you to think right now. I'm not going to have you turn to your neighbor. I'm not one of those preachers. But I want you to take a second. I want you to think of five people that you know need to be saved. Okay? Ready? Think of five people. I'm going to think of I got my five. Everybody have their five? All right. Watch this. Are you ready? I want you to think of five more. I got five. 
Ready? Watch this. Why don't you think of five more? I got my phone. How long could we go? How long? Hours? It would never. We would go as long as we couldn't think of any more people that we know because we know hundreds and hundreds and it's multiplied by the people here. There are thousands of people represented by this small country church of people that need to be saved. The harvest is plenteous. It's an impossible task of the work that we have to do. And they said, stop gazing toward heaven. I mentioned my brother this morning. and My dad's in heaven. I've got family in heaven, but I want to say this this morning. They are not going anywhere. It is time to stop gazing up into heaven and looking at where they went and saying, while I'm still here, there is still work to do. I am not going to allow those that have went on before to take my attention and my focus off of the work that needs to be done. And sometimes people lose a, a parent or they lose a spouse and they or a child and they literally stand gazing up into heaven waiting until they go but God is saying they're with me I know where they are get your focus back on the work Amen. they were standing gazing up to their savior as he went away he had just given them instruction and the angel said why are you standing here gazing he's coming back someday but in the meantime they needed to go back to Jerusalem and get started on the work. And I'm encouraging you this morning. I want you to look forward to heaven. I want you to prepare for heaven. I want you to get excited for heaven. But I don't want you to spend your life standing around, staring up, waiting on it. It'll be here soon enough. Amen. You young people, I know you think heaven, if you live to be a ripe old age, I know you think it's going to be a long way away, but I promise it'll be here before you know it. Amen. He said, you shall receive power. That power was the coming of the Holy Ghost. We see it in the very next chapter, in Acts chapter two. The Holy Ghost came and sat upon them. It filled them, they were filled. The Bible said it filled the entire house of where they were waiting and they were praying and they were in one accord. And the Holy Ghost came and dwelt inside of them and began to change them. The, the disciple, the apostle Peter, He's one of the most well-known followers of Jesus, but he's also the most erratic. He's all over the place. He's walking on the water, and then he's drowning. He's proclaiming, I'll never leave you, and then he's denying. He's saying, I, I'll, I'll feed your sheep, Lord, I'll do this, and then he's cutting off the ear of a, of a soldier. I mean, he's all over the place, but there was something that happened in Acts chapter two. When he was filled with the Holy Ghost, he was never that way again. He was never up one day and down the next when he got filled with the Holy Ghost. He was never the same. He was more stable. He was more strong because he was now, he had that spirit dwell, dwelling inside of him. He had a power, but that power was not for show. And, and I, I love to preach. I love to preach and I love to preach and you shall. I love to preach and listen, all of us preachers love Nick, don't you act like you don't love it. When you're preaching, everybody gets happy and starts clapping. Don't you like that? Sure, it makes us feel good. And I'm telling you, there's no better place in the world than up front when the Holy Ghost is moving and the anointing that I feel right now, Debbie's raising her hand, she'll tell you there is, there's no roller coaster, there, there's, no, there's no drama, there's no play, there's no movie, there's no musical, there's nothing in this world that can compare with being up here when the Holy Ghost is moving. But sometimes if we're not careful, we turn it into a show instead of power that can change people's lives. Effective preaching is not about what it looks like. It's about the power that goes out and the effect that it has on the people that's listening. As a matter of fact, you get into the, if you want to get into the debate in Acts chapter 2 of what actually happened when the Holy Spirit came. And, and I, again, for those that we don't, we don't believe, when I say believe, we don't teach or preach that the evidence of the coming of the Holy Spirit is that you will speak in an unknown tongue. Now, other denominations 
Pentecostals, uh, um, uh, apostolics, those that believe that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it will be evidenced by speaking in tongues. Now, it doesn't offend me. I'm not afraid of it. We've had people in here to preach, sing, that believe in that, but they respect our pulpit and they don't talk about that. I preach in their churches and I don't get into that. There's enough things we agree on that we don't have to get up in front of everybody and disagree on those things, okay? But what I believe happened if you, if you look at the scripture and really look at what happened, when they began to preach, there were all sorts of people in Jerusalem at that time that, that spoke in all kinds of different languages. They were all in for the feast and the things that were happening. And they, these disciples now, after the filling of the Holy Ghost, they go out and they begin to preach the gospel. And... So there were people there, there were people there that spoke whatever. Let's we'll just start making up languages. If they, if they were, if they spoke Greek and they were speaking in Aramaic, or if somebody was there and they, they I'm sure there was no Frenchman there, but if somebody was there and they spoke Fr- French, and somebody was there that spoke Spanish, and somebody was there that spoke Russian, and they're preaching this message in Hebrew. Everybody heard that in their own language. That was the gift of tongues. Is that right now, if somebody, and I know we've had foreign exchange students here before, that if they, whatever they speak, I would get up and be so full of the Holy Ghost that I'm preaching in English and they're hearing it in Spanish. That was the gift of tongues. That's what I believe if you read it through. That's what I believe happened. That's power. And it began to make an impossible task possible. That is the power that they received to preach the gospel. It was for a purpose. It was for a plan. It was not just for show. And as much as we enjoy enjoy it, it was not just for enjoyment. I've got to move on. The impossible task, the Holy Ghost made it, number one, able to carry the message. There was a multiplying effect of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost impacts one person, it does not just impact one person. It can impact five or 10 or 20 from that one. And so what I want to encourage you this morning is don't worry about impacting a hundred people. Just find one. Just find one this year that you can share the gospel with, that you can win over to the Lord because then maybe that person is the one that will win 10 or 15 or a hundred. Every great evangelist out there, every great ministry out there that has led to hundreds and thousands of people being saved all started because somebody cared enough to share the gospel with one person. We could go into the back story. I've shared it here. I won't take the time. But that one person who nobody knows their name is the one that won Billy Graham to the Lord. Nobody know we know who that is, but I'm saying if I just said that name, unless you've heard that story, you'd be like, who? Who? Somebody you never heard of cared enough to invite and to take Billy Graham to church to a camp meeting where he got And for decades, tens of thousands of people all over the world were brought into the kingdom of God because somebody told Billy Graham, I'll stop and get you and pick you up and take you to the camp meeting. Who's your one that might win 10? There's a multiplying. The impossible task was made possible because the Holy Ghost allowed them to carry the message. I remember when I was a boy before Morgantown had built their fellowship hall We used to rent out the old Parker gym. That's where we'd have our church dinners. If the weather was, we had an old old, uh, shelter house, but if the weather wasn't, you know, very good or whatever, they they could rent out Parker gym. And I remember they had, I don't know if it was past appreciation. I don't know if it, I don't know what it was. It was something that was, you know, kind of honoring my grandpa. And he'd been pastor there for a long, long time. 
And I'll never forget this. I think I have a picture of it somewhere. On the wall, they had this thing. I know mom's going, mom always says, you remember everything. It's not always a gift. Sometimes I have too many things rattling around in there. But they, they had his name as the pastor. And under, they had all these little paper cut out sheep. These little paper sheep cut out with names on them. And it was all the people that had been saved under his ministry, or at least all the people at Morgantown that went there had been saved while he was the pastor. I'll never forget that. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but the older I've got, the more I realize just how wrong that is. Yes, he was the shepherd, he was the pastor, but those sheep didn't belong to him because, listen, shepherds don't begat sheep. Sheep begat sheep. And so we don't need a list here about all the sheep that have come to know the Lord since I've been the pastor because I'm the pastor. You're the sheep. Those that have come to the Lord, it is because of you. It is because of your work. It's because of your witness. It's because of your life, your prayer, your fasting, your sacrifice, your bringing in of the harvest. I'm here to overlook and I'm here to preach and I'll help you in any way that I can. But the sheep that are born is because of you and not because of the pastor. I've always thought it, for all you sports fans, one of the most unfair statistics there are is win-loss records for quarterbacks. Now, I know some of you don't care about sports, but I'm just going to say this anyway. Win-loss records for a quarterback. So let's just say I'm the quarterback for what team? The Bengals. I'd prefer not to be drafted by the Bengals, but anyway... <clears throat> I'm the quarterback for the Bengals. They've traded Joe Burrow. They wanted me. <laughs> and uh, we're, playing the, we're playing the Ravens. And uh, I, our offense scores 42 points against the Ravens' defense. And our defense gives up 45 points, and I lose. And I get an L beside my name because I'm the quarterback. Next week, we play the Browns. Our defense only gives up 14 points. I, on the offense, only score 17. But we win. And I get a win. Now, which one did I play better? The one I got a loss on. Not the one I got a win. Well, sometimes we give credit to people that don't deserve it. And it always strikes me funny when evangelists and people want to give evangelists, boy, they, got, they were there preaching and 15 people got saved. They didn't get saved because that evangelist preached. They got saved because the sheep have been praying and fasting and working and inviting and carrying a burden. And yes, God used that evangelist to come in and preach that message, but it was the sheep that begat the sheep. Number two, the Holy Ghost made an impossible task possible because... It cannot be done by the flesh alone. It is too heavy. The load and the responsibility are too much. It's too hard. The fight, the struggle, it's too hard. And I want to encourage you, do it while you can. Young people, young couples, young families, don't use the excuse that you're too busy. I'm not going to pat me and Bethany on the back because we've made our share of mistakes, but I can tell you this. Now, we had a lot of help from our parents. We had help from even my grandparents who watched our kids when we were little. But I want to tell you something. We, we taught Sunday school. We were youth pastors. We, I, was, I was preaching revivals. We were singing. We were, we were busy, busy, busy. But we never said, well, we got kids. We just can't do anything anymore because the work of the Lord needed to come first before everything else. And I want to tell you, if you... Because you can do things now with the, with the strength that you have. Debbie's dad always talked about to shout and to work for the Lord when you're young, when you have strength. Because when you get older, you can't do what you used to do. Can somebody say amen? amen. amen. Yeah. I got off the couch last night. I'd been watching, I was watching basketball. and got up off the couch a little bit. And I was so stiff that I, walked down, I was walking down the hall like this. But I knew nobody was looking, so I just walked. 
And I got into the kitchen. I saw Noah in there, so I stood up straight and I walked like this. And he was in there. I said, I had worked all day long. I had, I had mowed and weeded four yards. I'd been on a mower, I had a weeder in my hand all day long. I told Noah, I said, I can still work all day long. I said, I said, I can't lift my hands above my shoulders. My shoulders were hurting so bad, I, couldn't, I could not hardly get my hands up to take my hat off. I got so sore. I'm telling you, I can't do what I used to do. I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good one hey, now. What kind of music are you listening to? <laughs> the older you get, everything gets harder to do and, and working for the Lord is no different because you don't have the strength to do what you used to do. And I don't mean to embarrass her in any way. There's still nobody that gets behind the pulpit and the anointing falls any harder or any faster than my mother-in-law. She's still one of the greatest preachers that God has ever put on this earth. And she's still anointed. But she'll be the first to tell you she can't preach night after night after night after night like she used to. Her body won't her allow. Her spirit is willing but her body won't allow. And I promise you, inside of her is still that preacher that desires to preach, but her body won't let her. Listen, I know it's busy. I know your families now are, have needs. I know you're involved. I know how crazy life is, but work for the Lord while you can because there's coming a day when you can't do what you used to be able to do. I gotta move on. It's too heavy, it's too hard, and it's too heady. It's, too, under, it's too, too hard to understand in the flesh. This cannot be done in the flesh alone. And then lastly, I've touched on this last week, but the, the Holy Spirit allowed this to be possible because it changed the world. In Acts chapter 17, I won't take the time to read it all, but you will see... All these things were happening. Paul and Silas had been thrown into prison. People were upset. Everything had got, there's just, their lives were so disrupted because of the gospel and because of this, this preaching and people getting saved. These people got mad and they just went into the house of this man named Jason and they go in and grab him and their followers and they bring them in and said, these people turned our world upside down. That's what it says in Acts chapter 17. Read it. These are they that turned the world upside down. <clears throat> now, they weren't talking about in a good way. They said our lives were just the way we wanted until they came preaching that stupid message about Jesus and they messed everything up. And that's the response people will have in your world and in your life if you'll confront them with the gospel is say, leave me alone, don't mess up my life. Don't mess up my routine. Don't mess up the things I like to do. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will change the world. There are few things that can truly turn the world upside down. Having children is one of those things. It will change your world. Sickness will turn your world upside down. But what about the gospel? What about the power of the Holy Ghost? They were simply, think of this, they were really only upset because their lives had been disrupted. I know the task seems impossible, but we have been endued with power from on high to complete an impossible task by the power of the Holy Ghost. What the world and what even man says is impossible has been made possible simply by the Holy Ghost. And so when the Holy Spirit came, and just as we stand, David, Tim, could you come? to understand really what happened. I, I don't always like this explanation because I don't want to make it seem like G Jesus was limited. Jesus was not limited, but he said, is it, it is expedient that I go away. Because he said, if I don't go, then the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, cannot come. And he's saying, so I'm going to leave and go back to my Father's side and the Holy Spirit will come and now the Holy Spirit will be in all places with all people that accept Him. Jesus was
was only in one place at a time. As amazing as he was, and he, oh, he's the son of God. He couldn't be more amazing. But where he was, if he was in Jericho, he was in Jericho. If he was in Jerusalem, he was in Jerusalem. But now, when they started in Jerusalem, think of this. When they started preaching in Jerusalem and people got saved and the Holy Spirit came and dwelt inside of them. Nick, when they went to, to the rest of Judea and people got saved and the Holy Spirit moved inside of them and they went to Samaria and they preached and the Spirit got inside of the people that got saved and they went, guess where, where the Holy Spirit was? Samaria, still in Judea and still in Jerusalem. Because the Holy Spirit is now everywhere. An impossible task made possible. This morning, if you need Him, if you need this, and He's calling you to Him, then come and let Him come and dwell inside of you. Let the Holy Spirit move into your life.